So the, the work I'm going to talk about today is uh, in collaboration with a, with a bunch of people, and so it's mo it's you know largely not not my work, but I, but I'm you know, um, you know it's a, too too many people to sort of sort of really name. So um so undefined behavior is this kind of fundamental part of C++, and there's lots of things we could talk about. There's a lot of uh, things we could talk about. We could talk about scary examples, sanitizers. Um so so we're not gonna we're not gonna do that today. Um, so, so I'm not going to do that stuff, and there have been, it looks like, four talks in the last two years at CPPCon on undefined behavior. They're all online. They're, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty interesting stuff, and so I'd encourage you to, um, you know, to check those out if you, if you have a minute and you, you know, have 45 minutes for YouTube. So, although I said I'm not going to talk about undefined behavior in C++, I'm just going to do the quick 30-second introduction just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page. So this is all the stuff you don't, you're not supposed to do. It's hard to not, it's hard to avoid doing it. You're not supposed to do it. Nothing actually stops you from doing it. So this is the sharpest sharp edges, right? This is the, this is the, this is the nasty sharp edges. And the consequences of undefined behaviors range from completely nothing, everything works as expected, all the way to somebody runs code on your machine. And um, so the undefined behaviors include, there's, so there's sort of unfortunately not an exhaustive list of them for C++. This is kind of um, a little bit of a bummer sometimes to me. Um, but it includes things like use after free, array out of bounds, modifying a string literal, overflowing assigned integer, divide by zero, strict aliasing violations, this kind of thing. So these are undefined behaviors in C++, and again, that's not really the, the, the this, this overlaps heavily with the content of the talk today, but it's not, it's not the subject. So this talk is going to be talking about so how the undefined behavior kind of works internally in a compiler. And by compiler here, I mostly mean heavily optimizing compiler. If you don't have a heavily optimizing compiler, the compiler really doesn't need to think about this very much at all. So it's not, it's not a very interesting topic if we're doing a bad job um, generating object code. So everything that you already understand about undefined behavior still applies. So you know, nothing, you know, the, we're just going to build on things that you already understand and kind of add a few conceptual things that, that might be a little different than, than things that, that you've thought about if you're, not, um, if you're not a compiler hacker. And my goal is going to be kind of um, to structure this talk as a bit of an essay, perhaps, and to convince you of a few points that, um, that I think are, are sort of at least bare thinking about. So the first thing I'd like to convince you of is that we really do want undefined behavior in a compiler IR. And so here I'll give you a, uh, and so, so IR is um, intermediate representation. It's the, uh, you know, it's the, it's, the, it's the language with which the compiler does most of the optimization heavy lifting. And so here we have a little bit of uh, C++ code, and it's just, it's just, it's just silly, but um, there's a loop that iterates 10 times, and it's going to save into the k variable and then return it the largest value of the loop iterator, of the, of the, of the, of the loop index that um, is a multiple of 8. So it's, so, so it's very silly. And the reason I picked this, uh, this example is just to show that, um, you know, here k isn't initialized, but k is certainly not going to be returned uninitialized, if that, if that makes sense, right? The, the logic, it makes it absolutely clear that that's what's going to happen. So if we translate this into LLVM intermediate representation, we get kind of a bunch of stuff, and the compiler's done a fine job here, and most of it you don't really care about. So what I want to do is just call your attention to one of the lines here, the phi node here, um, at, at the, the phi node here, is basically what it's saying is the percent six value either gets the k that came in from the from before the loop executed, or it gets the k that came from the previous loop iteration. So that kind of makes sense. It's just it's just it's just the compiler's way of of uh, merging those two incoming possible values for k. And since k was uninitialized, it gets an undef there. It gets a, it gets a, it gets an undefined value, and this stops the compiler from having to make up something for k. It just says it doesn't matter. You know, use whatever's sitting in a register or something like that. And so this example is sort of you know it's it's not necessarily um, you know the most compelling example, but this kind of stuff happens a ton, right? And most of the time when I show examples in this talk, I'll be sort of using kind of simple things as a stand-in for little things that happen a lot in the while the compiler is operating, and it's just this kind of thing happens a lot, and it's important for overall code generation quality to be able to represent this case where we don't care. And so in this talk, I'll be using sort of a pseudo LLVMIR, most, mostly not that pseudo, mostly real LLVMIR, but sometimes I take some liberties with the syntax just to make things a little bit easier to display. Um, so the IR, again, is, the, is this um, language spoken by the middle end of the compiler, and middle end makes no sense, but whatever. Um, but this is where the heavy lifting happens. And um, mostly you won't need to understand it. I'll just kind of point out the parts that matter, but I think it sort of helps to look at the real thing. And then I also just want to point out that real similar issues to the ones I'll be using, I'll be demonstrating with LLVM, come up in all optimizing compilers and all heavily optimizing compilers. So GCC has these same sorts of issues and concepts, and so, do, so, so, do, so, so does Microsoft C. 
And the details are different, but the, but the overall structure and pattern of the thing is, is, is very similar across compilers. And so I hope you will kind of call me on it. I know it's a little bit bigger room here than we had been in, but if I don't explain something adequately um, or I mess up something, I always like to kind of get things backwards when I talk because it's sort of, you know, it's hard to keep things straight when I'm looking at so many people. Um, I hope you call me on it, and, and um, you know, like especially Chandler can just be like, you know. Um, so, uh, okay, so the second point I'd like to um, convince you of is that one of the real strong points of undefined behavior inside the compiler is that it allows a decoupling of safety checks from unsafe operations. So we like our programs to be safe in the sense that we like our programs not to execute undefined behavior. And one of the ways we make programs safe is by putting, putting dynamic safety checks in them. And if we had a compiler intermediate representation that, was, that needed to be safe all the time, then the safety checks would be kind of folded into the operations. So we might have a safe division operation, which makes sure that it's, um, the, 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 we're not dividing by zero. And then by rolling those two things together, we don't have to worry about undefined behavior. We don't have to worry about unsafety, but we created this kind of CISC style operation that has a lot of stuff bundled in it, and that's gonna make it harder to optimize this kind of thing. So what we really wanna be able to do is break up the, the more complicated operation into some sort of an assertion that we're not dividing by zero, and then a raw, unsafe division operation that's gonna map cleanly onto the underlying processor abstractions. And so this decoupling um, facilitates a lot of good compiler transformations, but really it um, forces us to deal in undefined behavior because as we optimize more, we're gonna end up doing things like possibly, if, if Y is loop invariant, hoisting it out of the loop, and now the distance between the check, the safety check, and then the subsequent unsafe, now unsafe operation, the distance between them is gonna increase, and the safety check may go away completely, and we'll just be left with the residual um, unsafe operation, and this is what we want. So we want undefined behavior in this intermediate representation because it allows this kind of, um, this kind of flow of safety checks around the program where we push the safety checks as early as possible, and if at all possible, eliminate them all. So safe languages like Rust and Swift, they sort of make this kind of particularly important. So mostly we try to write safe C++, right? We try to write C++ that isn't gonna execute undefined behavior, but that's not really um, enforced on us in any way by the, by the language. Rust and Swift and other languages similarly, and I've picked those two examples, not only because they're safe, but because they compile to LLVM, these bake the safety into the language. And so let's take this tiny little Swift function, which is, which is just silly. All it does is takes the low 16 bits of two integers and then adds those together and return, returns the addition. So if we do sort of a straightforward translation of that Swift code into LLVMIR, we get kind of a lot of stuff. And it doesn't matter too much, most of it doesn't matter too much, but you can see we have the two mask operations. And then the whole rest of the function is concerned with adding two integers and making sure we catch the resulting overflow. So Swift um, always traps on, on, on signed integer overflow unless you specifically opt out. And so all the rest of it has to deal with that, but you can see that this machinery is unnecessary here, right? It's completely obvious that by, through the masking operations we've, we've headed off any, any, any overflow. And so if we run this um, sort, of, sort of not terribly optimized IR through the op LLVM optimizer, we end up with something much nicer. We end up with a raw addition operation that's gonna map cleanly onto the processor. And basically the four LLVM instructions here are gonna map onto four processor instructions. And then moreover, something even a little bit more interesting has happened the flavor of LLVM addition that the compiler has chosen is this add with these two qualifiers after it. There's one that says it's undefined if this does an unsigned wraparound, unsigned overflow, and it's also undefined if it does a signed wraparound. So the compiler has basically selected the weakest possible integer addition instruction that it, that it has available, and it was able to do that because it has these, um, uh, this, this data flow facts from the, from the masking operations. And what, those, what these tags on the addition will do is, if this function gets in line, perhaps enable subsequent optimizations that, that, um, that can benefit from the, from, the weaker, from the weaker add semantics. So what I'm just sort of trying to show here is that, you know, even in a safe language, or especially in a safe language, this kind of undefined behavior really um, facilitates breaking up the different things that are going on, decomposing them, so the compiler can focus attention on them separately. Okay, now we're gonna sort of start getting into the nitty-gritties a little bit more. So, um, 
So undefined behavior in, in C++ is kind of like a bomb, is when you do it, it explodes right then, and as far as the standard's concerned, your program has just lost all meaning. So it's, it's sort of this immediate effect, and we don't need to reason about what happens afterwards. And that kind of undefined behavior is useful in a compiler intermediate representation, and it exists, but it's not really enough. And what we need in a compiler is we need undefined behavior notions that are robust with respect to speculative execution. A compiler just fundamentally wants to speculate. It wants to take code that um, wasn't necessarily going to execute and execute it unconditionally. And this requires undefined behavior mechanisms that don't explode quite so fast. Because you can, see, you can sort of see, and I'll show an example in a minute, that if we speculatively execute code that wouldn't have executed, we've taken a program that wasn't undefined and we've, and we've blown it up accidentally. And this is, this is of course, um, completely not what the compiler is allowed to do. So we want something more like a time bomb. It might go off later, or it might just be a dud. It might not go off at all. That's sort of the, the bad analogy that I like, to, I like to use here. OK, so here is a fragment of C++. And so what I want to do is ignore the memory operation, the, or ignore the potential for undefined behavior related to the, memory, to, the mem to the memory here. So let's just assume that A has enough storage associated with it. And let's just focus on the integer undefined behavior that, is potential, that, that, that there's potential for here. So if we come up with the weakest precondition for executing this code without executing undefined behavior, assuming that, there's, that, the, that the array is not a problem, then we get the requirement that either n is less than 1 or x is not int max. Is that sort of obvious? We either don't execute the loop any times, or we do, but we don't overflow the signed integer. Okay, So that's the, kind of the weakest precondition for this loop. So now let's take this loop and let's do kind of the straightforward translation into LLVMIR. And so this is a fairly, you know, somewhat optimized already. And we got a lot of instructions here. And let me just sort of very quickly tell you what they're doing. So we initially branch into the head of the loop. The head of the loop is only deciding whether the loop needs to execute or whether we bail. So if the loop termination condition is met, it branches to an exit target that, that, that's not shown here that doesn't matter. So if the loop's termination condition is not met, then we're going to branch into the body, which is going to do the actual work associated with it. It computes x plus 1, it stores it into a sub i, and it increments i. So it's all fair and good so far. This is a, this is a legit translation of the C++ into LVM. There's no, there's no problem. But on the other hand, um, one thing we can sort of notice when we look at this code is, is that neither of the arguments to the, to the add here have changed inside the loop, right? 1 is a constant, and x hasn't been changed anywhere inside the loop body. So that's loop invariant code, and we can start looking for ways to make the code a little faster by moving the loop invariant code to the top of the loop body so it doesn't execute every iteration. And so this is, you know, not an example of profiting enormously from loop invariant code motion, but in the general case, in, you know, for, for real code, loop invariant code motion matters, and it's a, it's a, it's a thing that really, really we have to do to, to, to do a good job. So what we do is we make a little bit of room up at the head of the function in, 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 in a block. We're going to move the add up to the top. And now we have to ask ourselves, did we create a problem? And so what's, what's the answer? Why didn't we create a problem? Yes, we did. Yeah, OK. Well, okay. In a simple version of undefined behavior where it explodes, like in C++, we did create a problem because we've taken the precondition, which so, the, so, the, so the, the code used to require that either n is less than 1 or x is not int max. And now we've changed the precondition to be um, x, is, x is not int max. So we've strengthened the precondition. Um, so this is wrong, right? The compiler has, has clearly done the wrong thing here if that addition exploded the meaning of our program. OK, so what we want is a kind of undefined behavior that's robust with respect to this kind of code motion. So let's talk about how we make that work. So, but fundamentally, the thing is the compiler, what it would have done there if that addition that undefined addition exploded, what it would have done is made the code less defined than it was. So when you give C++ code or whatever to a compiler like LLVM, it's generally not going to make it necessarily more defined, right? Sometimes it does, but not necessarily. But it can't make it less defined. This is the fundamental job of the compiler, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail a little bit later. So let's go through the different cases. So here we have a model where undefined behavior is a time bomb. It has a deferred effect. And let's look at the three different cases. So one case is x is not int max, in which case, no problem, right? We never got any undefined behavior at all. So the second case is x was int max, and um, n was less than 1. So the loop body's not going to execute. So this addition comes up with an undefined value. So that created this sort of ticking bomb. But when we 
go through the loop header, that just jumps out of the loop and there's no problem. The ticking time bomb never went off. The X1 value just died. It just went into oblivion. It never got, it never got used in a way that would set off, set, off, set off the explosion. So that was good too. So in the third case, X is int max and N is greater than or equal to one. So now we get this undefined value here. And so now we're, so, so, so the bomb is sort of ticking here. And it goes off when we, um, potentially, at least depending on how we've defined things, goes off when we try to store that to, to memory. So, have we created a problem here? No, of course not, because the pro program was already undefined in the source version. Does that sort of make sense? So it was already undefined. This case we haven't made worse. The other cases were fine too. So this means that this particular translation works as long as we have this kind of a, this kind of a deferred undefined behavior model where it doesn't, where, where we're allowed to do something undefined, but, it, but, but, the, but the propagation of it is contained. And what this does is creates a model that's sort of fundamentally different from C and C++ where it explodes immediately. We get this, we sort of have to sort of, sort of remember what's going on with undefined behavior rather than just throwing up our hands and forgetting about everything, which is what we, can, which is what we can do at the, at, the, at the language level. So it makes, it gives the compiler freedom to do interesting things, but it also um, adds challenges in the sense that the reasoning about the program behavior becomes harder because we have these partially defined programs. Okay. So that gives us our sort of desired result. And so that's all, that's all kind of good, so no problem again. Okay, so what I wanna sort of convince you of now is that this deferred undefined behavior concept can work, it's great. But, you know, but what does work really mean? You know, what, is, what is work? And so um, basically all this is is a tool that we can use to justify compiler optimization. So there's no other purpose for this kind of concepts that I'm talking about other than letting us sort of mathematically justify transformations that want to be done to the programs. And so um, that's all good, but we have to be really, really careful when defining what this means. And so let me just give a couple of simple examples. So if we take this, un this deferred undefined value um, and XOR it with itself, does, that, does it stay undefined or did that clean it up, right? And we can make either choice, right? It's just an engineering trade-off, but we have to do one or the other, and whichever we do is going to enable some optimizations and disable others, right? It's just, just a bunch of trade-offs at this point. What if an undefined value is used as a, as, a, as, a, as a conditional and we branch? Well, we can either sort of explode the program right away at that point because it becomes too hard to reason about, or we could come up with some kind of non-deterministic semantics so we take both branches. So again, we can make either choice. It's not that big of a deal, but either choice we make, we're gonna have to take the consequences because it's gonna um, enable some optimizations that we'd like to do and prevent us from doing others. So one of the things that makes this, at least in my experience, a lot harder to think about than source program level undefined behavior, which is already hard enough to think, think about as we, all, as we all know, is that undefined behavior appears both on the source side of a transformation, so I'll call that, sometimes I'll call it the left-hand side, and also the target side of a transformation, the right-hand side, that is to say, the original code and the new code both has these partial undefined behaviors, and it really makes this kind of, um, it creates sort of intellectual problems that are, that are you know, they're sort of, um, that, are, that, are, that are thorny. So mathematically, this is all simple, right? There's no, math here beyond, um, you know, elementary set theory or something. Um, but in practice, getting this right is, is, is actually pretty hard. So what if the undefined value that we predict, that we've chosen, means just pr pick a value? So an undefined, um, an undefined value of type short is just gonna give us a value from, from, from short min to short max. So let's assume, let's just go with that for a minute. And now here's, here's sort of a problem with that, with that concept. So here's an optimization that compilers really would like to do. So we have something like A plus B is greater than A, and we like to optimize that to B greater than zero. And so hopefully it's clear that this works in C++. If you take a C++ program and you do this as a little source to source transformation, you're okay. Because if the addition had overflowed, your program went undefined, and if it didn't, then, then, then the mathematical result sort of works. Is that kind of, is hopefully, hopefully that's pretty clear? Okay, so we'd also like to do this at the LLVM level, but since we've kind of given up this exploding the world view of undefined behavior, since we've given up the option to just forget about reasoning about the program once something overflows, we have to actually follow through the consequences and make sure the optimization is justified. And so one way to see if an optimization is justified is to see if the source of the optimization, that is the left-hand side, and the target of the optimization return the same value for all choices of the, input, of the free input variables. If they don't, then the optimization doesn't work. So let's, so, so let's sort of do that. So let A be int max and B be one, okay? So now let's look at the left-hand side of that optimization. 
So if A is int max and B is one, then um, A plus B evaluates to undef, right? That overflows and becomes our undefined value. And now the question is, is the undefined value, which stands for any value of the integer type that we're using, the question is, is that greater than A? And that doesn't work because um, A is int max, and we can't pick a value out of that bag that's greater than int max. So does that kind of make sense? So that has to fold to false. Um, that has to, the left-hand side has to fold to false for, these, for these particular, this particular valuation of the inputs to the, to the, to the code. But on the other hand, if we, if we, if we fold this, 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 these um, values into the right-hand side, the question now is, is, is one greater than zero? And that's true. So we've made an optimization now that for a particular version of the inputs makes, takes something that was evaluating to false and evaluates it to true. So it's wrong. We can't do the optimization. It's not justified by the math, and we must not put it in the compiler. So. That's sort of a bummer, because we really wanted to do it. And it's not that this particular example, again, this particular example isn't so super, super awesome. It's just that it's, it's exemplary of a huge class of things like this that do actually sort of matter when you do them systematically over a large, over a large program. So, um, yeah, so, so, this does, so this doesn't justify. So to solve that problem of not getting the optimizations that we philosophically believe should, should fire when we compile code, <laughs> Um, LLVM adds this kind of second kind of deferred undefined behavior, and this is called a poison value. So the other one is called undef, and it stands for, like I said, any value, any legal value of the type that the undef is. Poison is worse. And the, not worse, I mean, it's, it's stronger. And so um, the way to understand poison quickly is to, is to observe that undef ended with zero gives zero, because whatever value you picked for that undef, it just becomes zeroed out. Poison doesn't have sort of a value-based interpretation. Poison ended with zero gives you poison again. It's sort of this ultimately contagious thing that's, that, that once you drop it into the data flow graph kind of just propagates, All right? And um, the good news is, is that um, it justifies this kind of optimization. So there's a, there's, a, there's a whole sort of class of optimizations that don't get justified by the undef concept, but that do get justified um, because we have a poison value. And so that's good. So we, it means we get some more um, optimizations that we wanted. But on the other hand, it turns out that sort of compiler engineers, and you know, there's not that many of these people, you know, a few thousand or whatever, uh, maybe, maybe only a few dozen or a few hundred that actually write these kind of optimizations. But it turns out that we've, we've through this design, sort of imposed a fairly high cognitive load on them, that getting, un getting optimizations right in terms of both kinds of undefined behavior is just, is just fairly tricky, all right? So the next point kind of in my, in my, in my essay here is that um, it's kind of a closed world inside the compiler. There's kind of this, whatever semantic decisions we make about the intermediate representation for a compiler, that doesn't leak, right? You have a source language and everybody has to deal with it. We have object, we have object code that matters because people have to make processors. The IR, we have completely free reign to define any semantics that we want. Um, so the, in, in, in this world, there's not really any such thing as good or evil, right? There's only engineering trade-offs that make the compiler more, more effective, all right? So we can do whatever we want. That's kind of the point I'm, I'm guessing. I mean, the point I'm, I'm saying. And the idea here is that we've made the conscious choice by introducing undefined behavior into the compiler IR to weaken the specifications for some of the operations. So some of these operations in LLVM now have, now have these narrow contracts. And this, this gives us the freedom to... Um, to, 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 this adds freedom on the left side of an optimization by weakening the specification of what's going on. But then it turns out that once you've weakened these specifications, the right-hand sides of the optimizations become harder because the operations you're using are weaker. Does that kind of is that, is that intuitively make sense? It's, a tricky, it's sort of a tricky thing. And the trade-offs are subtle, and the community, the LLVM community, is basically still working on making the right ones. It's, this isn't all quite settled. So I'm presenting kind of the, the current picture, and I'll tell you some, uh, what I'm going to do is sort of, sort of go through a little bit more of it and tell you about some ways where the, where the picture has kind of wandered, onto, wandered into some difficulty. No questions so far? Your earlier example would have meant that you'd have chosen poison instead of undead. 
Yeah, it's so, it's so, so, so good. So the question is, how do you know when you get undeaf and how do you know when you get poisoned? And that's basically baked into the rules. So you can think of like we, what we want, we don't exactly have this, but, 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 but Chandler's gonna make it so it's all good. Um, there's, a, there's, a ch there's a checking interpreter. So imagine, a, imagine you know, sort of the reference interpreter for LVMIR. And so something like overflowing, overflowing an integer is defined to give you poison. And something like um, we have an uninitialized uh, value coming into a fee node or something, there we'll use undef to get the different interpretation. So, and you know, it's, just, it's, just, it's, just, it's all just choices. So, so the rules for the, for the intermediate representation just say when we get which. And undef can, ap can appear explicitly in the IR as a constant, and poison is sort of kind of ephemeral. It doesn't ever appear written down, but that doesn't really matter. That's kind of, a, that's kind of, that's kind of not that important. So the question is, um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, so if someone in a loop overflows an integer by one and realize that unsigned results in zero, but signed maximum results in signed minimum, then that code is incorrect. That's right, that's right. So the question is, is yeah, so if integers overflow, then, then it goes undefined, but it's basically, um, you know, there's no hoping here, right? We don't care about programmer intent. The, the programmer intent is, is absolutely worthless here, right? The front end has lowered the code into LLVMIR. If it did it correctly, we have something that means the same thing as the source code meant, right? And now, now and there's, there's there, you know, it's math, right? This is just math. We have a mathematical meaning for stuff and we can do whatever we want that doesn't break it. So there's, so, if, if, so, so, so you're right, if, if, if this overflows and it causes that variable to lose meaning, then, then sure, but that's, that's, that's absolutely not our problem here. No, I mean, if someone relies on particular value after overflow. Oh, they made a bug. They, 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 sure, they've written a bug, just, but just like in C++ already, right? It's not, it's not, it's, we, have, we, haven't really, we haven't made anything any worse, but yeah. Or in C. Or in C. Ah, good, 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 good. Yeah, sorry, okay, that's good. I should, I should, I should have said. Um, if the overflow happens, um, the left-hand side was poison. And so, so, so we should go back to the, um, we should go back to the, the values. So, so, let's, so let's, let's do a model where A plus B gives poison when it overflows. So let A be int max and B equals one. So the left-hand side folds to poison. Is that, is that, is that sort of clear? The right-hand side now folds to true. I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail a little bit later, but we've taken something undefined and made it defined. That's always okay. Does that make sense? It's always okay to make things more defined. And if you think about it, the compiler does this enormously often all the time when it compiles. Enormously often. For example, we have these overflowing, undefined on overflow integers in C++, but those become machine operations that have two's complement, right? It's taken something less defined and made it more defined. Compilers just do this systematically all the way through the compilation, make things a little bit more defined as they go. They just can't do the other thing. The, the lattice theoretic view of this is absolutely the right one. Okay. That, that's absolutely, absolutely correct. And, and if I'm not talking about that, it's just because um, I don't know that, that the drawing the pretty pictures would help this talk. But, but, but that's, right. that's the way to think about it. Yes? Uh, no, not that it's poison greater than A. The left-hand side evaluates to poison. It doesn't evaluate to true. But we've ch that we can we can we we're free to rewrite that poisonous code, that code which is poisonous in this situation. Oh, you can do whatever you want. It, it, we can evaluate that to true or false or anything or leave it alone, um, as long as. We, so, but of course, I've only spoken about one possible valuation of the inputs. It has to be the same for all of them, and then we're and then we're fine. Yeah, and yeah, good. Okay, so okay, so um. So another point I want to kind of convince you of, and this is one that, you know, I think it's sort of obvious, but I think it's, it, bears, it bears saying or repeating. 
So a compiler IR is a real computer language. I don't say it's a real programming language because we don't program in it really, but it's a real computer language. It's a first class language. It needs well-documented semantics and it needs to be, you know, it needs to be, it needs to be something that we can turn into math. And if we don't have this true mapping to math from the IR, then we're just sort of hoping. We're, we're, we're doing hope-based optimization and, and this, this, this really can't work. So we need this semantics and we're stuck doing lots of proofs and this is what reasoning about compiler optimizations is. It's just proof after proof after proof. And you can even see these in the comments in the, in the compiler source code. People will emit these little, um, these little informal proofs in their comments. And this is how people reason about it and this is exactly the, exactly the right way to, to, to think about these things. And the other thing I want to say is that so it really is necessary to assign mathematical meaning to this IR, and that's sort of a treatment that relatively few compiler IRs have received, and nobody's done this for GCC as far as I know, or Microsoft Visual Studio, or um, Microsoft Visual C++, I mean, or Intel CC, or any, or any other compiler. So LLVM has received more of this attention. There's still work to do, but it's received more of this kind of attention than any other compiler that I'm aware of. Actually, that's not true. Research compilers that you won't use in production have received more of this kind of attention. But as far as production compilers go, I said the right thing. Okay, so now let's talk about what's really going on. And I've already kind of alluded to this a little bit, so I can go over this kind of quickly. So compiler optimizations are all about refinement. So we usually informally talk about compiler optimizations as maintaining equivalence. They take something and they change it into something faster, which does the same thing. But that's not really quite it. So what refinement just means is, it's, a, it's a sort of a, it's just a little bit more of a subtle notion than equivalence. What it means is if the source of the optimization, the left-hand side, is undefined for any particular value of the inputs, then the right-hand side can sort of do whatever it wants. And since we have these two kinds of undefined behavior in LLVM, I'm, I'm, I'm sweeping some stuff under the rug, right? It's a little more complicated than this, but, I'm give, but the, the, but the gist, gist that I'm giving you is, is correct. So on the other hand, if the left-hand side is defined for some particular value of the inputs, then the, then the, then the right-hand side, the, the target of the optimization, has to do the same thing. So if there's no undefined behavior, then we, we're, preserving, we're preserving equivalence. If there is undefined behavior, we're optionally removing it. And if the code is undefined for all possible inputs, you can see trivially from this definition, we can do anything. And, you know, and you, surely you've seen code you've written have, the, have that done to it by the compiler. Right? You wrote something that didn't quite make sense. Maybe it relied unconditionally on uninitialized storage. And GCC or whatever is just like, ah, fine, you know, you didn't want that at all. Um, and then, and so, so the compiler is doing its job um, here. You know. You know, and we, can you know, we could talk about whether that really makes sense at the language level. But at this level, it absolutely does. And there's, there's no controversy. OK, so, um, so then if every step in the compilation is a refinement, then the overall compilation is a refinement and therefore correct. So that's the definition of a correct compiler is that the final output refines the, the original source code. And a step of refinements just becomes a big refinement. OK, so that's what's really going on here. So let's, um, let's ask a few questions here. So, so since I'm a teacher, I, I like to ask qu qu the quiz. So let's ask which of these transformations are, are refinements. So, Add NSW is a flavor of addition which um, is undefined for signed wraparound and otherwise it's normal. So this is, this is C++ addition. So is it okay to optimize, or not optimize, I shouldn't say, to transform add NSW to add, where add is just like an instruction. It's, it's, it's a pure two's complement operation. So is, so is that okay? Is that a refinement? Yeah, of course it is, of course it is. Um, We've, we've, we've basically taken a loosely specified operation and tightened it up. And for the parts that remain, the, for, for the parts where we haven't changed the behavior, everything, everything operates the same, so that's fine. Okay, so add with un, undefined signed and undefined unsigned overflow, turning that into an add with just undefined signed overflow. Is that okay? Sure, of course it is. How about add NSW, change that to add and UW? Yeah, def definitely not. Okay, good. So okay, so, so we're on top of things, right? So this is this is pretty this is pretty easy stuff. So just to clarify, signed wraparound is when you go from all of its set to zero and signed overflow first it set to zero. Yeah, yeah. So 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 again, the add NSW is exactly mirrors the semantics of a C integer, of a C signed integer. And the add NUW has no analog in in in, in C or C. It's, it's, a, it's an internal concept that, that doesn't actually get used all that much in the compiler, but it's, but it's sometimes useful. Okay, so since we did the easy part, now we're gonna be serious. Um, now we're gonna get serious and, and do, a, do a serious example. So here's a fragment of code which 
if a condition is true, sets a variable to be A, otherwise sets the variable to be B. And so that's C or C++ or something. And here is a reasonable translation of that into LLVMIR. So it's branched based on the condition. You can see the branch based on the condition at the top. The branch targets actually don't do anything except branch to the, to the, to the merge node. And then all of the heavy lifting of picking the correct operand um, comes from the fee node. And this is just sort of how SSA intermediate representations work. And so there's nothing really interesting or magical or about, there's nothing interesting about this. This is a straightforward translation, okay? So now let's try to optimize it. So what LLVM wants to do, if possible, is take a conditional and lower it into a select instruction. The select instruction is um, basically, you might as well think of it as the ternary operator in C++, so it's a question colon. So the select, if the cond is true, evaluates to A, otherwise it evaluates to B. And so we have to ask ourselves, was that an okay operation? And it is, it's fine, it's all good, but we have a caveat here, which is that when, if poison, so one, one thing that becomes tricky here is whenever you do an optimization like this, you have to say, did it work if one or both operands are poison or undef? And so let's, so let's look at what it would take to make this correct if one of the operations was poison or undef. So the way the, this code works, the, the control flow based code works is, if we pick, for example, A because the condition was true, and B was poison, then that poison doesn't affect the result of the, of the, of the conditional operation. Does that, does, that, does, that, does that perfectly make sense? So the phenode node stops the poison. So this optimization is just fine as long as select also stops the poison from its not chosen operand. So is that hopefully completely clear? Okay, so, so we just need a pr appropriate semantics for select that does that. And so far there's no problem whatsoever, right? This is a perfectly good optimization, and it's a super useful one, because this probably becomes something like a C move, and we've gotten rid of some control flow, we've made our basic blocks bigger by getting rid of control flow, we've sort of simplified things that the compiler's seeing by, by kind of having this value-based code, and so this is, this is a reasonable thing to do. So let's look at another example now. So here's another, optimization, or another piece of LLVMIR. So this is completely separate from the first one. So now we have percent %y, which based on a different condition, is either gonna be true or some different value. And here now it's gonna be important that the, um, that the values on, the, the two values we're picking from are one bit, right? So now we're picking among two Booleans. So if condition is true, we get the true Boolean, otherwise we get the, this Boolean percent %w, all right? So this is, this is, all, this is all fine. Um, and now we're gonna ask the question, can we optimize that to um, math, to, to, to bitwise math? And that works too, and so I'm, I'm sort of, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to hedge my bets here. Locally, that's a perfectly fine optimization. Um, there'll, there'll be a global problem in a minute. So let's look at what happens here. So this operation propagates poison to percent %y if either of the inputs is poison, because that's how, bitwise math is defined to, um, to work in LLVM. So that's how that works. And so, but this we already said because of this requirement, this optimization required select to stop poison. So what have we done now in the second optimization, which is locally sort of consistent, but what have we actually done um, to our global system? Can anybody, is that, is that a refinement? If, yeah, we've made it less defined, right? Um, we've taken code that stopped poison on its non-taken branch, so if, so if cond2 is not true and percent %w is poison, um, this would have been defined and we've made it undefined because that's how OR works. So we basically just can't have these both, right? So, so, so we just don't, you know, you, you sometimes just don't get what you want. Um, in this, when you're doing this kind of work, and we sort of have to pick. And then the, the kind of awkward thing that's still getting worked out in LLVM is, is that LLVM currently does them both. Um, and mostly this is fine. Mostly it's completely fine, but it's at least conceivable that this will get us into trouble at some point. So here I've just shown on my laptop last night, um, you know, I just wrote the code that I showed in the second example there, ran it through the, Clang 6 optimizer and it, and, it, and, it, and it lowers the select into, into, into math. Yes? Undef is easier in this case because it's definitely stopped by this because remember undef was just a random value sort of. 
And so if you don't pick that value, then it definitely doesn't matter what it was. So undef is absolutely stopped by select regardless. And it's also stopped by, um, it's also stopped by an or in this case. So undef doesn't create a problem here. It's the, it's the extra contamination potential of poison that gets us into trouble here. So we've picked these rules to, be, to make it more poisonous to get optimizations. And now here, it's too poisonous and it sort of stops us. That's sort of the point I'm trying to make. That's right. You could you could you could make poison propagate too far. Well, now you're making a tricky argument. You're saying, can we do the wrong thing, which ends up being right? Does that, I think that's what you're saying. Basically, because you know that nobody else is going to come. Yeah, some amount of that stuff can be got away with. It's dodgy, though, and we don't want to do it if we can help it. But some of the amount of that, and like I said, Delvium actually right now does both of these, and it's benign in large-scale large, large scale testing. So something like what you're saying must be happening. Maybe Chandler knows more about this. Something, right? something, something like this must be happening. I don't know. But there's a few examples of this where things just, where, where, where different people have had different ideas about what poison means that have caused these conflicts between, you know, completely different passes, completely different parts of the code base, making different assumptions. And so there's a few of these things that we've kind of uncovered that are problematic and um, that need to be fixed. But um, I'll talk about this a little bit later. But this is, like I say, in large scale testing, this seems basically benign, but it's not for a good reason. So I wish I had a better answer. Maybe soon there'll be a better answer, but, but right now it's not, not that great of an answer. Okay, did that, did that kind of did did, did make sense? All right, so let's do one that's even possibly a bit more subtle. So here's another example where we want to do a loop unswitching optimization. And so loop unswitching <laughs> says we take a conditional where the conditional is, um, the, where, the, where the condition is loop invariant, and we're going to flip it inside out with a loop that's inside the, uh, the, the, the loop that the conditional is inside. So, we get, so as long as cond is loop invariant, we can take the code on the left and rewrite it as the code on the right. So now if cond, we do the while loop, um, else, we do the, um, else we do the second while loop. So this is a perfectly natural optimization that compilers do a lot. So the question is what, so now we always have to ask this, and this is, this is sort of one of the problems, is we always have to ask, well, what if some of the values flowing into the code were, were poison or undef? So what is something that happens, what if cond was poison? Well, the while loop may execute zero times, right? There's no obligation of a while loop to execute. So the original code, in the case the while loop didn't execute, is well-defined, even, even if cond is poison. The target code now is only well-defined if branching on poison is well-defined. Does that kind of make sense? So if branching on poison um, has some sort of non-deterministic semantics, which is actually, you would think that leads you into some sort of interpreter hell or something, but here it doesn't, because whichever while loop you pick, non-deterministically, neither of them operate. Neither of them fire, right? So that, so that little non-deterministic choice actually kind of gets neatly suppressed. And this kind of, this kind of idea of um, picking these definitions so that natural transformations lead to undefined behaviors which kind of quietly die, that's kind of one of the really beautiful things about how this all fits together. That's kind of very, it's very satisfying when it works. But again, notice that if branching on a poison explodes, this, doesn't, this transformation is illegal, but if branching on poison is okay, then, then we're perfectly fine. Okay, so that was the loop on switching optimization. And then another optimization that we really like to do is called global value numbering. And here what we've done is we've taken some code on the left-hand side, and once we pass the conditional, if t is equal to y, now we know several things. We know that um, t is the same as y is the same as um, w. And so what global value, numbering, global value numbering does is it observes these equivalences based on passing control flow, and then it picks a representative um, value from the set of possible producers of the same value, it just makes all of the consumers of the value use that one producer, if that makes sense. So what we've done is we've taken, we've observed that T, W, and Y um, are all the same, and now we can just um, call, call foo with Y. And so this is, um, this is perfectly fine. So now the question is, can we make a problem out of this? Did this actually work? So now let's go, let, now let's go through. So 
what we're looking for is an interaction with branching on poison, which we've already said has to be workable. It has to make sense to branch on poison. Okay, so, um, so the question is, what if y was poison? I'll make sure I get this one right. This is my hardest example. So if y was poison in the, um, in the initial code, let's see. Oh, now I'm going to get tripped up. Yeah, I had this one. If y was poison in the initial code, um, let's see. Yeah, oh, sorry. The, 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 the issue was y was poison and w wasn't, all right? So um, if branching on poison, which we said needs to be OK, is OK, then this works, but we accidentally pass poison to food. Does that kind of make sense? When we hadn't earlier. So if branching on poison is not OK, and we explode the world when it happens, then they're both undefined and there's no problem. OK, sorry, took me a minute there. I thought I had that one. Um, so, so one of these examples, I'll, I'll take questions in just a second, let me, let me just summarize. One of these requires branching on poison to do one thing, the other requires branching on poison to do the other thing, and it's another case where you just sort of can't always get what you want. Um, you have to pick one of these, and then, and then you know, and it's, it's, it's sort of hard to pick among these because they're sort of subtle trade-offs in the huge unknown um, code base that exists in the world that, are, you know, that, that, that uses, the, uses the compiler that we're talking about here. And so one of these will be better than the other, and we just have to, we just have to pick. So, um, and the problem is, is the compiler, again, wants to do both of these, kind of, and, and it's, it's not so good. So, so we'll have to back some of these out. So, so there are a couple of questions. Yeah, no, <laughs> you, don't, you, don't want to, you don't want to do that. You don't want to go there. Is it, sorry, the question was, could you somehow maybe have slightly different flavors of poison for different situations and then and do them differently? I'm not saying you couldn't possibly do something like that, but it would probably be going down a wrong path. It'd probably make things even worse rather than better. But, so you can play, with, like I said earlier, you can play any semantic game you want. So as long as you can make an internally consistent world, it's fine, but you can't make it too hard for people to think about. So if we say that if we say that branching on poison works and is just non-deterministic choice, then we you know then we either do the body or not. But the point is is that on the left side we either did this function call or not with a, with a non-poison operand, and we've made it more poisonous. So... Would you have an equation that defines why it would not poison the body? Um, no, y can, be, y can come in as poison. Y and T are independent, and global value numbering has mistakenly assumed that because that they compared equal that they were actually all could, one could always be replaced with the other, which isn't necessarily always the case because they could independently be poison even if they, even if they, even, even despite the comparison. It's, it's, it's a pretty subtle point, but, it, but again, it just comes up, you know, this is a case, and so it's really black and white though, right? This makes something pass a poison value to a function which didn't get the poison value earlier. It has to be wrong. We just, we, it just can't be acceptable. Well, just picked, right? If, if it, it possibly could have done a better choice. It, it, that's right, yeah. All, all we're saying is global value numbering just, just does whatever it wants. And um, if, it if it had a better, if it had some way to make a rational choice based on, not, based on knowing that one of them wasn't poison, like if there's a definitely is not poison analysis the compiler can use to prove that Y isn't poison, then it can go ahead and do this. So this is, we're talking about sort of the general case here, though. No, no, remember, if y is poison and we've said that you can branch on poison safely but it's non-deterministic, which we needed to make this go, then we've changed the behavior of the program. 
if branching based on poison explodes, this is fine, but this isn't fine. Sorry, if I hope I did, sorry, if I didn't make that clear enough, sorry. <laughs> this, 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 takes, this really takes a while, and I've spent a lot of hours um, doing these same things, and I, and I pro probably also didn't explain it well. So, so, but so the, but the, but the, but the, key, the key is is that it has to be one or the other, and each example requires a different one. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to remember to, to repeat the question now. So the question is, could we define two different flavors of if that, that behave appropriately in, in these examples and thus get away with both transformations? And the answer, again, is always yes. We can always do anything we want, but it probably just doesn't go lead to a place that we wanted to be. It probably leads to a, a semantics that's complicated enough that it's even worse to reason about. It's probably the case that one of these optimizations isn't worth it. Chandler. What is describing essentially freeze, though? Okay. So if you want to bake it in a different way, so yeah. So there are some proposals underway to alleviate these problems, and one of them is, that Chandler just alluded to, is a, uh, a, an operation called freeze, which takes a poison value and makes it, it's, 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 it really freezes it, makes it pick a value. So it unpoisons, it's a, way to, it's a way to get rid of poison in the data flow graph. And that's what's currently missing from LLVM that seems to probably give us a, a pretty neat way to sneak out of a lot of these. So if you did, so I wasn't going to talk about freeze because I was, I was really just trying to talk about the current situation. But this freeze thing is, is, really, is really sort of neat. You would freeze Y before doing this transformation, and now you've, now you're, now you've sort of sailed, you've sailed scot-free. And this freeze LLVM instruction, which depoisons things, becomes, should become largely free at the um, machine code level. It mostly just sort of means you can take whatever was sitting in a register. It's not quite true because you might have to remember it because if, if it has multiple uses. But it's sort of almost true that it shouldn't add much cost. Yeah, yeah it seems a lot of the, the questions that we're asking from the audience are about um, are there ways where we can take undefined behavior and make it be not undefined? You, you, all, you all think about that sometimes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anyway. So, um, sorry, another question. There's a CSE pass as well, and it may do something different with this. I'm just talking about what happens if you do GVN. Chandler. Just for the record, the CSE pass is the exact same bug. Okay. GVN is a, is a technique of doing composite expression elimination. Uh, it doesn't really matter which technique you use. If it's powerful enough to do the transformation at all, if you get this bug. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll try to repeat the question in, in the future. I, I know. I'm, I'm really bad at that. Okay, so we'll move on, and I'm happy to come back to this later if that helps. But again, you can't always get what you want. So the, so the, so the things I would like you to have taken away so far is that deferred undefined behavior is like a super useful concept, and it's very elegant. It's a really neat mechanism, but it's quite tricky, and analogous problems occur in any other compiler where similar concepts have been um, introduced. It's just, it's, just, it's, just, it's just fairly hard stuff. So optimizations are math, right? It's not even hard math. It's just math that we can't quite wrap our heads around because the cardinality of the sets involved are big. Um, not only optimizations are math, but reasoning about undefined behavior using math is also easy, right? This is just not hard mathematically. Um, it's just hard for humans. The real problem is, is that everyone writing optimizations need to use the same math, and then nobody can make a mistake with the math that they use once they're using the same math. So these are, the, these are sort of the... These are the problems that if we solve, then we don't get, then we don't get any more miscompiles out of the optimizer. So now I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about pointers just a bit. And so this is, again, going to tie into undefined behavior, but I'm going to have to start off um, a little bit obliquely. So in an assembly language, it's generally the case that an integer and a pointer is more or less the same thing, right? The, it's an integer until you use it as an, as an, as an address. 
In um, a high-level language, especially a safe high-level language like Java or something, pointers and integers have almost no relationship between them at all, right? There's no way to get between these two, these two, these two things if you stay in a safe language. C++ is in this kind of awkward space, right, where it wants to optimize like a high-level language, but on the other hand, it wants to provide control like a low-level language, and getting these two things together is really not so easy. There's some real thorny things. And so I'm going to talk about stuff here that kind of has similar concerns in C++ and in LLVM IR, you know, because basically LLVM was, you know, one of the things that was primarily engineered to do is be a C++ compiler. But on the other hand, the IR level concerns are, um, are the same exact concerns we get compiling Rust or Swift or whatever other language targets LLVM. So what we need is a memory model, and I'm not going to be talking about concurrent memory models here. So, so just purely sequential memory models. So it should be a really easy case, right? So the memory model is the thing which decides for any memory operation, is it defined or not? And for every load, what does it return? So this is you know, sort of asking easy questions. <coughs> and I'll use some code like this to motivate the example. So we'll malloc a couple of, a couple of blocks, and we're just going to ask the question of whether these operations are defined or not and what the printf prints. And so we, can't, we don't even want to start that until we, um, until we have a memory model. So let's talk about the easiest memory model. And so this is kind of, you might think about it as the old style C memory model from the, from the 70s or whatever, is a flat memory model. So in a flat memory model, let's see what happens. So the first line of code we execute is, the, is q sub 2 equals 0. So that clearly is not undefined and puts a 0 into our, into our memory here. But then in a flat memory model, P sub 6 is also defined, right? The memory is flat. Addresses are addresses. If you jump between allocated objects, there's no problem. Um, and so P, sub, P, P plus 6 um, evaluates to the same cell that we just assigned 0 to and put, one, put a 1 there. And now we're forced to um, print 1 at the bottom. And so let's talk about the pros and cons of this. So on the advantage side, this is pretty simple, right? Pointers really are addresses in the, in the, at the machine level, and we're just doing address math, and things come out pretty nicely. On the flip side, the, well, the, on the con side, um, this is really hard to optimize. This defeats almost all pointer optimizations that you wanted to do. Because here's the thing. Here, this was forced to print one, but at compile time, we didn't know where these things were going to be allocated necessarily, right? We probably had no idea, so we couldn't possibly optimize that to print one. And basically, in this kind of a model, almost any memory access that we can't prove is inbounds invalidates our view of the rest of memory. Does that kind of make sense? So the flat memory model is completely unacceptable for a modern compiler. I just want to, you know, it's just, it's just the starting point. So let's talk about a different memory model that works better for languages like C++ and also, also safe languages. So this is called the data flow based provenance model. And here we're going to um, remember where pointers come from in order to sort of do some disambiguation. So we have these two malloc cells. So we execute the q sub 2 equals 0, and so that's all fine. That's not undefined behavior. But then p sub 6 is out of bounds. It does not, in the sort of abstract machine, store um, a 1 into, into the other cell. And so um, the printf prints 0. And moreover, in this case, we could predict that at compile time. We could predict that at compile time because we know that no matter what index we use based on p, it didn't invalidate any part of q. Does that sort of make sense? Because there's just no way to get between allocated blocks. So this is something pretty similar to um, how, you know, how you can think of a, C, a smart, uh, you know, decently smart C++ compiler operating. Marshall. Okay. Um, this all makes sense to me. It just doesn't match my intuition, which is that once you hit that second line, that you, be, you, you get nothing. You have no guarantees on the So, okay, yeah. So, so, I'm, so, so the question is, Marshall asks, is, is why am I continuing to reason about this after the undefined? And so I'm glad you asked that. So, what I really wanted to show here is that the compiler, which might not have known that that was undefined, maybe, maybe instead of 6, that was x, could, it, it could do this optimization. The compiler could remember what it previously knew about the contents of q, and it knew that that wouldn't be invalidated by any operation on p. So you're, so you're, so you're, so you're right. I'm glad you brought that up. Thanks. OK, so this is all well and good. It works just fine. And um, you know, we, we can, it's, easy to, it's, easy to, it's easy to optimize this. So no problem, but here is one of the things that makes this tricky. In C++ and in C and in LLVM, we can make a pointer to an integer, do any math we want, convert it back to a pointer and dereference it. And so the question is, what, does that, what effect does that have on the memory model that we have? And remember, if we had a flat memory model, this would be pretty easy. 
it's pretty easy to resolve this because the integers and the flat memory model mesh, mesh together extremely well. We don't have sort of a symbolic view of the heap, and so there's no problem. The problem is the flat memory model destroys almost all of our optimizations. It's completely unacceptable. Also unacceptable is staying with a pure, easy, symbolic memory model because that's going to break all the system level codes that actually do something meaningful with these integers that have been converted back to pointers and, um, and then dereferenced. So we have to walk a fine line. We have to preserve the behaviors that the standard says we preserve while also getting lots of optimizations. And so let's talk about how we make that work. So the basic idea here is to split pointers into two categories. And these names for these pointers are bad, and I was, I've been trying to convince people to use better, different ones, and I haven't been successful. So anyway, logical pointers are ones that you normally think about using in high-level C++ code. So these are ones that originated allocations. So P is a logical pointer, Q is a logical pointer, and R is a logical pointer. They're all logical pointers as long as they have a root in, an, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a malloc or an, or an alloc or something, some, some other thing like that. So these pointers have to stay within allocated objects or go one past the end. And these use that, that data flow based provenance that, that I mentioned on a, a, couple, a couple slides ago. So logical pointers originating at different allocations just never alias. And this is an extremely powerful tool that the, the compiler can use to disambiguate. Marshall. That's another kind of, that's just another kind of allocation. Kind of, yeah, so sorry, when I say allocation, I should, I should have been clear. Or global variable, it's another kind of allocation. These, these, are, these are all, these are all, the, these, are all the, 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 these, these are all separate objects in the memory model. Yeah, so I'm, pl I'm playing a little bit. Okay. I'm just trying to simplify just a little bit. So there's kind of something kind of funny, so I'll just take a little detour here. C kind of screws up this logical pointer model. Um, so if you, if you, if you not, ever noticed in the C standard, the C compiler is forced to return two pointers equaling each other if, there, if, if, if two objects are allocated one ne next to the other, like happens on the stack, and you have a pointer, a valid pointer one past the end of one object, which happens to be the same as the pointer to the beginning of the next object, C, like I say, actually forces the, that equality comparison to return equal. So what it does is it, like they somehow sneaked a little bit of 1970s flat memory model into their standard, despite really wanting to make a modern kind of logical memory model. And this, this sort of sucks, and compilers basically ignore it. Um, um, but but LLVM, LLVM is pretty is actually pretty careful with it. At least at least in the version I was playing with when I was making these slides, GCC just doesn't care. Um, and so the, one of the things that I like in the C++ standard is it actually gets this right. It says that in the exact same situation, the result of the comparison is unspecified. What that means is the compiler is never forced to generate code that actually observes the actual layout of the objects at runtime. The compiler can just say, well. Since there was no basis for you to have assumed that there was a relation between them, they, they, then, they, then they don't compare equal if the compiler wishes to do that. And this is absolutely the right answer. And it lets the compiler stay in this kind of logical pointer comfort zone as long as we're not doing the thing that I'm going to talk about next, which is integer to pointer conversions. Yes. So the question is, the question is, what about structures? And so, so, so the answer is, well, that, that's a totally different case. So here, for, for purposes of this talk, I'm just not talking about the, that, those kind of guarantees. I'm only talking about separate allocations. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to mention that even, so I'm glad you reminded me. Okay, so back to the memory model. So there's a different kind of pointer that's trickier, and these are what we call physical pointers. And again, I don't like the name, but whatever. Um, so these are pointers that originate at a cast from an integer to a pointer. So x is an integer, p is a physical pointer, and so is q, because they both, share a, they, they both share a common root. And so here's the trick, is that physical pointers are going to use, still use this data flow-based provenance that we use to track aliasing for logical pointers, but they're also going to have some control flow-based provenance, which is going to try to formalize the idea that programs aren't kind of a, allowed to make reliable guesses about allocation. So if I take a pointer, if I take some random integer, like you know, 7 million, convert it to a pointer and dereference it, that might overlap something because the heap allocator just happened to put something at 7 million. But at compile time, I'm not allowed to count on that, and the compiler exploits that to, to, to say that that store didn't update some random object. Does that kind of make sense? Otherwise, if the compiler didn't make an assumption like this, every time a physical pointer was stored through, it'd have to basically invalidate everything. So we're trying to avoid that. 
All right, this is what this is what we're trying to do by sort of using this kind of um, anti-guessing kind of kind of kind of ra rationale in the in the in the compiler. Let me let me let me do a little bit more. Let me do a little bit more. And, 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 uh, yeah. Okay. So um, so so let's go let's go through a little bit of an example. So here we have P, Q, and R. These are pointer. These are these are um, three three allocated objects, and X is an integer, and so X is an integer that came from P and had three added to it. And so here's the deal. While we're in the integer domain, one thing we could have done in the compiler is tried to remember that that integer came from a pointer and kind of and and keep that in mind. Like, where did it come from and what are we going to do? Um, that's not um, generally how that's going to work. We're, we're going to sort of mostly try to reason about things on the pointer side. So once it becomes a pointer again, now we do the tracking. But we don't want to put rules on the kind of integer math you can do just because integers could be converted into pointers. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so let's look at what goes on here. So, um, so because x was compared against y, now it's basically um, has some provenance. It has this kind of this version of x here, but not this one. Um, I'm sorry, not this version. Yeah, this version of x here gets some extra provenance. It's observed through the comparison. Um, the uh, that it's through the comparison. It's observed that um, um, that, 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 that it's going to point to um, part of Q. Does that kind of make sense? So through the d control flow based provenance, the compiler now knows that that. That, that, that this might point somewhere into Q. It sort of gives it permission to access it. It also has permission, based on its original sort of derivation, to access P. But X isn't allowed to mess with R because nothing in either the control flow provenance or the data flow provenance of the pointer that we've gotten here allow, allows that to happen. And so what this is basically doing is it were te it's telling the compiler what parts of memory, based on these control and data flows, need to be invalidated through, sto by, through resulting stores so we don't have to end up invalidating everything and, blow and completely blowing away um, the, the optimization potential. Matt. The comparison with X and Y there, obviously, intuitively, we can see that that means that we know P points to Q. But does that mean that the value in, like, the SSA, the, the Y, or whatever, is, is tracked as being, this is, although it's an integer, so, so the way this works is, when we have at a store like this, if the math was too hard, no, sorry, the question. <laughs> um, okay. It just seems like, like we've lost. The, by the time we've done here, y equals into q, we've lost the fact that y also was q. Yeah, so the question is, haven't we lost too much information to actually do this kind of reasoning? And the answer is, in complicated situations, we would. It's in simple situations like this where the, where the math is pretty simple that we're not going to have lost the information and we can, and we can avoid pessimizing the compiler. In complicated situations where these things were loaded from disk and stuff, then, then, you know, then, then, then we'll have to be more careful. Okay, so, um, so that means that this store through, um, through, this, through this pointer here is defined. But on the other hand, the second one, because, because so that pointer points there, but the second one, um, the second pointer, uh, the, sec the second store is undefined because it hasn't, at this program point, we haven't observed, we haven't made this observation that gives us the right to have made a prediction about where the allocated blocks actually ended up sitting. I hope that kind of makes sense. It's sort of thorny and nasty, but this is kind of how, how the compiler ends up trying to avoid pessimizing the pointer analysis completely in the presence of pointers that came from integers. Yes? At the LLVM level, they, that, that, they, they, the, the math does work out neater. It's not, um, so I think you're, you're, you're bringing in a C++ concept that, I, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't come in here. Yes? How does this affect, um, say, like, uh, hardware, like register math, sort of like where you're implicitly more forced to take an address because you know that there is something there and you cast that? You're, you're 
That's, that still has to work. So the question is, how does this work for our embedded systems, where we um, where we just take a, some big old integer, convert it to a pointer, and go? Um, that that has that has to still work. And um, so the compiler is going to do that. But what what in that case, where the where we're storing through some kind of random pointer, if that pointer hasn't been compared to allocated blocks, we can avoid invalidating them. So we can so we can still keep some of our optimizations while still doing the right thing for the embedded system. Ah, how do the question is how does it know that malloc is an allocation? That 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 that's baked in. Okay, so you, at that, in, if you're writing an allocator, it would just know that virtual memory now. If you're writing an allocator, this becomes um, this becomes um, this level of reasoning probably wouldn't happen in the compiler. It's, you're you're stuck in a lower level domain where it's where it's not going to be following what's going on very well, yeah. unless you somehow clue it in that this is an allocator. You, you know, so unless you somehow patch into that logic in the compiler. So in, the, so in this line, if we change three to one, then this would become defined. That's right, exactly. Yeah. So what I want to do is sort of look at a couple of the consequences of this model. So here's something. So if P is a logical pointer, and we take that and convert it to an integer and make that integer back into a pointer, that's not necessarily exactly the same pointer. It has the same value, right? And, and, the, and the, the various standards um, force that, but the provenance information might be different. So one thing that LLVM wants to do is have a people optimization pass that drops a round trip through pointer to integer and integer to pointer and just optimizes that to P, and that's actually wrong because that can end up dropping the control flow-based provenance facts. The, the optimized pointer only has data flow-based provenance, whereas the physical pointer that resulted from the cast from that would, might have additional provenance. So little things, little things that you would really would intuitively think would work might not work, and you have to play out the consequences. And again, this is why we do math, right? And again, this, this is why we do math. So global value numbering also causes trouble in this domain by sort of fairly willy-nilly replacing pointers, even when their provenance information might, uh, might differ. And you can run into cases where, with a case I already mentioned earlier, where two pointers compare equal. One of them is the legal pointer one past the end of one block. The other is the pointer to the start of the next block. They compare equal, but only one of them is dereferenceable, right? Only one of them can do reference, and if GVN replaces one with the other, now we've now we've now we've um, now we've messed up, All right? Jenna. Uh, is, it, is it fair to say that this is fundamentally because GVN and these other optimizations are based on data flow, and the provenance is based on control flow? Is that the well, this? so the question is, is is this because GVN is based on data flow and pointers are based on control flow? So. The example I just used didn't involve physical pointers with control flow-based provenance. So it's, it's, it's the GVN is based on data flow, but it's a, not the right data flow. And it turns out that if you disable this particular GVN thing of replacing pointers, but, uh, but there's still a lot of special cases where you can do it. For example, comparisons with null pointers and things. There's still a lot of, a lot of good stuff you can get. Um, so you don't throw away all that much if you disable the offending cases here. And that's, I think, what will have to be done. And anyway, Code that plays tricks like these, you can, you, you can currently get both GCC and LVM to miscompile them, but it's pretty tough. You have to go looking for trouble pretty seriously. Right? OK, um, just one more quick thing. Um, it's only valid to compare pointers that have um, overlapping live ranges. And so one thing that, you know, that becomes illegal in a model like this is if we have code that, like on the left-hand slide and we want to optimize it to reduce the live range of P because, um, because for example, that the storage allocated by P isn't used below this point anywhere. That can take code that looked defined and made it undefined. We just have to be more careful with that kind of code motion. And there's, there's a bunch of little things like this where moving allocations around, moving compares around um, might become restricted based on sort of subtle, subtle concerns. Okay, so getting back to the big picture, though, now I want to sort of sort of pop back to the overall to very top level point of my talk here, which is that compiler engineers really hate being wrong, and users hate miscompile. So all of our incentives are lined up, right? All of our incentives are lined up. So the fix is to agree on the undefined behavior semantics, and in all of them, it's close, 
And like I was saying, it, this is the, compi the production compiler that does the best job of actually making a formal model out of, its, out of its IR and undefined behavior. Other compilers don't do as well. So LLVM is ahead of the pack but still needs work. Agree on an undefined behavior semantics and then give the compiler engineers the tools they need to avoid being wrong. This includes clear documentation, an undefined behavior where IR um, interpreter that Chandler is, is making, and um, formal methods-based tools that I'll give an example of uh, right now. So here's a tool that, that, that some people made um, called Alive. What it is, it's a little domain-specific language for reasoning about LLVM people optimizations. And it's also a formal methods-based tool that actually does proofs about people optimizations. And you can get, use this online. You don't have to install it. And I just want to show a couple of super quick examples. So here's the example that we were looking at earlier. So we're selecting, um, based on a condition, either this one bit result or this one bit result, and turning it into or. And so I already showed you that LLVM6 does this, but Alive says no. Alive's opinionated. Alive actually understands at a deep level all the undefined behavior stuff that's going on, and it actually tells you the right thing. Target is more poisonous for so than source, and it gives you concrete values of the inputs, which, which illustrate the problem. Does that kind of make sense? So it's based on a SAT solver, right? And it made a model that violated the, the constraints, and now, it's, and now it's reporting you values based on that model. So like I say, it's got opinions about what's valid and what's not in LLVM. And so then there's a second job, which is making LLVM conform to whatever Alive thinks, but we can't even do that until Alive has been taught to think the right things, and it, it's not quite there yet. Um, I'll just do another example to show you one that does verify. So this is our, our sort of famous and very fun optimization of um, taking a unsigned division by constant, and unsigned division, I mean division sucks, we don't want to do it, and turning it into um, a wider value, multiply, I'm going to multiply and a shift and then a truncate, right? So this, is, this perfectly works. And compilers do this routinely, although here I've sort of fibbed a little bit because LVM does it in the back end, and here I've done it in, in the IR. And you know, the, 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 the tool just checks this and proves it correct. And you know, this is cool, right? It's like, it proves it for all possible values of the inputs, and it works. It uses math, it's great. It makes sure that the, the undefined behavior stuff hasn't been messed up, the, everything, that everything, you know, it's doing the refinement check for real. Of course, this one we could have uh, brute forced because there's two of the 16 you know, possibilities, so, so it, wasn't, it wasn't very hard to brute force. But the tool, the SAT solver based tool, will still do these proofs even if you have 128 or 256 bits of input, as long as, as, long as the solver, as long as the SAT solver actually works. So, this is the kind of thing that we want to provide to compiler engineers to make it easier for them to respect the rules, because otherwise, reasoning about this stuff is just, is just pretty hard. Okay, so. LLVM is really good at doing these kind of IR level optimizations. It's a very strong, um, it's a very strong optimizer. But the kinds of little tricks and things that I've been showing you, I've only showed you a couple out of thousands of them. And so there's 30,000 lines of code just for the people transformation pass in LLVM. And there's a bunch of other passes that are more code that do things like that. And so my research agenda as a professor is that I don't like writing this by hand and isn't there a better way? And so I work on a tool, and I'm not gonna talk about this much and I'm almost out of time anyway, but I work on this tool called Super, which is a super optimizer, which takes some intermediate representation and uses it as a specification. So it takes that and then it searches for a refinement of that intermediate representation that's cheaper to execute. And it does the and it, and it, and it proves that it proves the refinement using using a solver just like the alive tool did. But it adding to what the alive did is the search procedure that actually can find things that we didn't know about ahead of time. So this thing can make new optimizations. It can discover new optimizations. Um, and then one of the fun things that I learned while doing this is that the solver is sort of fiendish and it aggressively trips over every single undefined behavior problem that you give it. So if you don't specify things exactly tightly, it'll go ahead and find the loopholes, because that's, sol that's what solvers do. It's very unpleasant. And so this is how I kind of got into this undefined behavior and LLVM stuff that I've been talking about today, is through this, through this sort of gateway where I need it to be solved or my stupid tool can't work. Um, so that's the current situation is sorta mostly works, but, but breaks programs sometimes, and it's mostly not our fault, unfortunately. So, um, and it turned out though that at some level I might have picked the wrong compiler to start with because as I said on the last slide, LLVM is an extremely strong IR level optimizer. Even so, some optimizations discovered by Super have made it into LLVM, but they've also made it into other compilers. So people, at two different groups at Microsoft have used Super to find undiscovered optimizations in their much weaker um, middle end optimizers. 
So Super had a lot more to work with there. And they sort of used the tool by hand and then implemented the optimizations. And there's also a WebAssembly tool called Binarian that's just, just now, just as of the last few weeks, getting some Super-based optimizations. So anyway, so this is kind of like, you know, this is, this is like sort of piddly stuff. This is where we're sort of discovering stuff, discovering new optimizations, and implementing them by hand. And that's not really where I want to go. What I really want to go is replace big pieces of um, handwritten code in the compiler with just table-driven stuff, where all the entries in the table are proved correct by a SAT solver. And what's more, they're derived by something solver-based, so we don't have to come up with all the entries in the table by hand. If you look in the Go compiler, this table actually exists. It's just a table, a rewrite rule table. It's written by hand. Nobody proved it. But Something like this tool that I have could, you know, take the size of that rewrite rule list and go and multiply it, you know, make it 20 times bigger with um, new optimizations, and then that would make their compiler slow so they don't want it. So there's a whole bunch of pieces of the puzzle here, like applying the discovered optimizations really fast, right? And so there's some research to do that, 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 that's kind of interesting. Anyway, so my belief is that these derived optimizations can be more effective, more correct, and applied faster than the handwritten versions, but that's sort of a, that's complete hot air. Um, but, I, but I think it's true, and we'll, we'll see over the next five or ten years whether that's true. Maybe, maybe that's optimistic. Okay, so undefined behavior is fundamental in compiler IRs, and the thing that I thought, one of the really kind of pleasing things about this all is, is how well undefined behavior meshes with completely safe programming languages. That's just kind of a neat, I, I don't know, I just find that a very, very neat connection. Um, I hope that it's useful for you to understand this stuff because sometimes an optimization that you really wanted to go doesn't go. Um, sometimes it's hard to understand what the compiler's thinking. And this kind of stuff that I'm telling you is one of the things the compiler's thinking about. When it does or doesn't do something, you may be able to appeal to these explanations I've given today to help understand what's going on. Um, dealing with undefined behavior for compiler developers is easier if We've really carefully thought out the meaning, and we have tool support, and that's sort of some ongoing stuff in the LLVM community, where mostly the stuff that I told you today is, is good and is going to be the model going forward, but it's going to need a few tweaks um, before everything is really completely, um, completely on solid ground. And finally, I think future compilers, this, this sort of idea of engineering these big, complicated compilers by hand, you know, chips aren't getting faster, right? And engineering these big, complicated, optimizing compilers by hand kind of sucks. It's tough to get it all right. I think a substantial degree of automation in this process is, is what the future holds. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, could you say that again? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. So you're asking the question, in all of my slides, and I was going to mention this and I forgot, in all of my slides, I'm just eliding the fact that, my, that the allocation can fail. I just don't want to deal in these, in these slides. Yeah, so sorry about that. I should have said. We're just assuming that they succeed and not dealing with that here. Yeah. The question is, why is it undefined behavior to compare a pointer after it's been freed? Well, remember, all these rules are rules we just make up. So there's not necessarily a good answer. In the standard, I think, if you go to the language level, I think it was because that segment might have been dropped, right? We may have a segmented machine, and that segment might have been dropped as part of the free operation. So it may seg fault. So the standard is trying to provide leeway for weird machines. At the LLVM level, I don't know. I don't know why we would make that same decision. It's possibly just inherited it from C and C++. Just, just, just maybe, okay, just channeling. We might reuse it. That's right. But so, so, but that's so. But the fact that we might reuse it doesn't change the fact that the comparison could be made valid still. I mean, it could be still defined. What? Well, just whatever value happened to be sitting there. I mean, it's just some sort of non-deterministic value instead of undefined. If we make it, if we make it that, then we can't flag it as a bug. Yeah. So, so, so 
Maybe that's it. Yeah, okay. That's okay, that's probably the best answer, which Chandler said, that it's, it's, it's more useful. And again, these decisions are all, we can do whatever we want, and just, we just try to pick the most useful thing. So the question is, is it fairly trivial, I mean, is it fairly common for a non-trivial application to include some sort of a compiler? You mean some sort of a just-in-time compiler or something? Yeah, I don't have any particular recommendations. I mean, LLVM makes a perfectly good just-in-time compiler. If it's, it's not like super quick, but it generates pretty good code. Um, I'm saying, you know, very domain-specific though. Yeah, no, I don't think I have a recommendation. <laughs>